I never knew there was an occupation called a professional visitor until I became a priest and started visiting nursing homes. I'd never heard of the professional visitor. About 13 years ago, I was taking Holy Communion to a devout Catholic woman for about the third time that I'd been to visit this home. And I noticed the same woman sitting next to her. And she normally would walk out of the room and I always presumed she was family. And so on the third occasion, I asked her, I said, are you the daughter? And she says, no, I, I'm, a, I'm a professional visitor. I said, a, a professional visitor, what's that? And she said, well, for families that are too busy or for families who, she said, find sickness a bit too confronting, they can employ a, a professional visitor who can attend to their relatives. And she said, I, I said, well, what do you do? She said, well, I read the magazines to them. I do their makeup, um, at least the women. I'm not saying today, in today's world, you never know. And, uh, and I keep them company. And it's a full-time job. And um, I, distinctly meaning, I distinctly remember feeling, you know, how, what, what, quite scandalised. You know, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not indifferent to the fact that people have to work, right? And we, we might have other familial responsibilities to attend to. But specifically when she said, oh, for those that find sickness too confronting, something didn't sit right with me. More recently, I, I was speaking to a young palliative care doctor, a really smart young fellow, a devout Catholic. And I asked him, you know, you know since they've legalised euthanasia in New South Wales, how has it affected you and your profession? You're a palliative care doctor. These are early days, right? This has only been happening for a few months. But one thing he noticed was this. He said, you know, before, when someone said, you know, I'm really suffering and, uh, you know, I'm feeling depressed. He said, look, the doctors would gather around together and think, what can we do to help this person? Can we change their medication? Can we get pastoral care teams in? What can we do to help that person? Let's give them more time. Let's find a way. He said, now that the possibility of euthanasia is there, those conversations are already stopping. Like he says, even for me as a Catholic, it's almost like we want euthanasia. Oh, well, we don't even talk about it anymore. We don't even make the effort. We don't make the time. Now, this is a, a heavy topic, but the question of suffering and our response to suffering represents one of the most defining elements of the Catholic identity. If, if, life, if life has no inherent meaning, you know, if this is all chance, yeah, of course, then suffering has no inherent meaning. However, if Christ is the source of meaning and Christ himself suffers, then he suffers in order to convict us in faith that Christians do not suffer without hope. And even our sufferings then have meaning. Our hope thus rests on who we believe Jesus is. If we believe Jesus is God, then we always will have hope in suffering. Which brings us to today's gospel, which really has these two parts. In the first part, Jesus raises what's probably the most important question we have to ask in our lives. He says, who do people say that I am? Who do they, who do they think I am? Who do you think Jesus is? And he's asking, who do the people say I am? He's, in other words, he's asking, what's the popular opinion? And the disciples say, well, some think you are a prophet. Others say you're John the Baptist. Others think you're Elijah. And then he says, well, you, my disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter, the first pope, he knows the identity of Jesus Christ. He knows who he is. He said, you are the Christ. You are God. Okay, so now you have the identity established. You know, you believe that I am God. So let me tell you this. I will suffer grievously. I will be rejected. And I will be put to death. You are the Christ and then you say you are going to suffer? Why? Now, even the man who's chosen to be the first pope, he's really challenged by this. And so he responds with very human thinking. He says, he takes our Lord away and starts to remonstrate with him. You know, surely you're not going to suffer and die like this. And... You've got to run away from your suffering and death. And our Lord is so angry. Like he rebukes him with the harshest of responses. He calls the first Pope Satan. So harsh because he's missed the point. If you really believed who you say that I am, if you really believed I'm the Christ, then you would still have hope even though I suffer and die. This brings us to the second part of the gospel. It's when our Lord then connects our identity as followers of Jesus. And we are people that really believe that he is God and we really believe that. Then he says, well, you're called to find hope, meaning and redemption in your own sufferings. If anyone wants to be a follower of mine, 
Let him renounce himself, take up his cross and follow me. Anyone who loses his life for my sake or the sake of the gospel finds life. Again, Jesus is calling us to consider our own identity as Christians. You say you believe in me, but do you live as if you believe? Do you say you have hope or do you practice that you have hope? Because as St. James says in the second reading, faith, faith without good works, faith without the cross is a dead faith. It's dead because it has no identity. It has no hope. And the sign, the sign that our faith is dead, the sign that our Christian identity is being shaped by human thinking and not divine thinking, is revealed in the most powerful way when we suffer. When we suffer, that really reveals where our faith is. Now, do we embrace our cross with hope? Knowing that with crucifixion there is always resurrection? Or, with the human thinking, do we seek the early escape? Do we run away? And let me be clear, our Lord is not saying, go out and get yourself martyred. He's not saying, go out and find ways to make your life horrible and suffer. He's not saying that at all. That's not the Catholic way. The reality is, every day of every human life has its own little crosses. Sometimes they're bigger crosses, but most of them there's lots of little crosses in everyday life. For instance, going to visit someone who is sick when we really don't feel like it. That's the cross. Restraining ourselves from gossiping or making disparaging remarks about someone who's really hurt us. Holding that back and saying, no, I'm not going to go into that. That's the cross. Turning down the offer of a lot more money in order to spend more time with our children. That's the cross. Getting to Mass and praying consistently, even when we're tired, even when we're lazy. That's the cross. You know, even more generally, just offering up our sufferings for the conversion of those who don't come to Mass or away from their faith. That's the cross. Because in every one of those examples... We are showing how our faith changes and shapes our lives, our deeds. How our hope, how our faith gives meaning to our suffering. And it's in our suffering that we're still manifesting hope. If we don't truly believe in Christ, if we don't truly believe he is who he says he is, then we will likely approach our sufferings with very human thinking. We will live not bearing our sufferings with patience, Because hope is purified by patience. Instead, we will live our lives seeking instant gratification. And this is a key reason why fewer and fewer people can experience the real meaning of hope in their suffering. Because we've become so accustomed to getting what we want quickly. You know, in a digital world, that's pretty obvious. You press a few buttons and the next day you get it. And even at the level of ideas, we want instant gratification Instead of contemplating the bigger picture, instead of really trying to think through the issues, we want to come to a rapid conclusion. We don't want to embrace the cross of deep thinking or deep prayer or deep contemplation. And because we do that, we miss the opportunity to find the moments of redemption, the moments of redemption in the crosses of our lives. So let's not waste our share in Christ's suffering. It's through our sufferings that we are given the chance to witness to hope. And if we witness to hope, we will certainly share in Christ's glory.